Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's take a look at the headlines first. POK residents defy threats, demand rights amid Kashmir Solidarity Day. Deadly twin blasts rock Pakistan on the eve of general elections. And UN report exposes Taliban complicity as Al-Qaeda spreads its network across Afghanistan. Let's begin the show with Pakistan, a country which despite witnessing massive anti-government protests has not refrained from using terrorism as a tool against its own people and in areas which are under its forceful occupation. In Pakistan-occupied Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan, where the locals are fighting for their rights, Islamabad has been using banned outfits to terrorize peaceful protesters. We have this special report. This video has surfaced on social media platforms. A Pakistan-backed terrorist is blatantly threatening the people in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, intimidating them not to oppose Kashmir's Solidarity Day. On February 5 every year, Pakistan observes the day to show its so-called support and unity with the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Unfortunately, the people in POK and Gilgit, Pakistan, the areas under Pakistani occupation, are showing no support to Pakistan's Kashmir Solidarity Day, and they are demanding their rights. Several such videos also went viral, where terrorists were seen threatening people in cities across POK and Gilgit, Baltistan. The sight of armed militants parading with impunity in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, openly brandishing weapons under the tacit approval of the Pakistani army, sends a clear message of fear and oppression. And even in the face of threats from terrorist groups, the locals brave the streets, demanding their rights and dignities. आज हमें जो है वो टेररिज्म का सामना है एक्सट्रीमिज्म का सामना है एक ऑर्गेनाइजेशन यूनाइटेड जिहाद काउंसिल जिसके ज़ेर एहतमाम जो है वो सोलह ऑर्गेनाइजेशन बैन आउटफिट जो है वो जिसका हेडक्वार्टर मुजफ्फराबाद में मौजूद है वो हमारे लोगों को आज टेरोराइज करते हैं और वो ये कहते हैं कि आप जो है वो ये एहतजाज नहीं कर सकते ये कितनी बड़ी बदकस्मती और कितनी बड़ी महरूमी है कि आज हम बंदूक के साय तले हमारी ये मूवमेंट जो है वो परवान चढ़ी है Pakistan has been exposed for its politics on Kashmir and how it has mistreated the people in POK and Gilgit Baltistan for over seven decades. Both occupied territories, which remained part of erstwhile princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, are suffering with issues like poverty, unemployment, high inflation and illiteracy. The locals are continuously holding protests against inflation, high wheat prices, inflated electricity bills and many other issues. Kashmiris living abroad, far from their homeland, have also joined the chorus of dissent, questioning the intention of Pakistan. From London to Brussels, their voices ring out in defiance, challenging the narrative of Kashmir Solidarity Day as a mere facade. As the world looks on, Pakistan's Kashmir Solidarity Day stands exposed for what it truly is, a thinly veiled attempt 
to divert attention from internal strife. While Islamabad pretends to champion the cause of Kashmiri's self-determination, the reality in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir and Gilgit-Baltistan tells a different story. Here people face not only economic hardships but also political marginalization, especially under projects like the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. The discontent brewing in these regions reflects a deep and reflects a deeper yearning for autonomy and genuine representation. As more people speak out, they are calling for change that goes beyond borders, echoing a universal wish for justice and dignity. Pakistan finds itself at a crossroads, forced to confront the reality of its policies and the aspirations of the people it claims to represent. Pakistan has begun counting votes after polling ended in an election marred by terror attacks, explosions and the suspension of mobile phone services. Just a day before the election, deadly explosions occurred near electoral candidates' offices in Balochistan, which claimed at least 27 lives and wounded a dozen others. The nation casted its ballots against the backdrop of a severe economic crisis, a surge in terrorism and political unrest. We have this report. Pakistan's general election was held amidst escalating attacks and rising violence. On the eve of the election, two deadly blasts an hour apart near electoral candidates' offices in the southwestern province of Balochistan killed over 25 people and wounded dozens, raising concerns over security. The first explosion, which claimed 14 lives, targeted the office of an independent election candidate in Pishin district, while the second blast occurred in Kila Sefula near the Afghan border, near an office of Jamiat Ulema Islam, a religious party previously targeted by militant attacks. Abhi tak jo subah se jo blast hui khanuzi kesi karizat mein, jin mein se chauda zakhmi laaye gaye the, chauda mein se char ki shahadat ho chuki hai, to jo das yahan pe share se unko mukhtalif to mukhtalif inoto mein ilaj ke liye bhijwa diya gaya. In a separate incident in Pakistan's northwestern province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, at least 10 police officers were killed in an attack on a police station. Since the announcement of the general elections in November, the Park Institute for Peace Studies reported over 18 attacks on political leaders and workers across Pakistan, with 10 of them occurring in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa alone. In Balochistan, many voters feel neglected by the country's political parties due to the province's limited representation in parliament, often perceiving candidates as imposed figures with minimal connections to Balochistan. There was an apprehension that uh, there will be these kind of attacks uh, on the electoral process. Uh, in fact, just before, the, the, uh, the attacks have been happening for over a week now. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was an attack on a police station. Over a dozen policemen were killed. Uh, there have been a number of other attacks at smaller levels against candidates in Balochistan. It's particularly bad uh, because uh, both in the Baloch areas as well as the Pashtun areas, there's a lot of resistance uh, to, the, uh, to, to Pakistan out there and people don't identify themselves with the elections. So I think there is uh, this wave of violence which has taken over. The election came almost two years since the previous Prime Minister, cricketer-turned-politician Imran Khan was ousted in a no-confidence vote. Khan was jailed on corruption charges last year and was barred from standing. Recently, he was convicted in three other cases and is facing years in prison. But people were able to vote for Nawaz Sharif, the PMLN leader who at the time of the last election was beginning a sentence for corruption. Sharif was ousted in 1999 military coup 
and had his third term cut short in 2017, but he recently returned from self-imposed exile. He had his lifetime ban on holding office overturned and also got his criminal record wiped clean at the end of last year, allowing him to stand for general elections. From all accounts, these elections on 8 February are not just the most predictable, but also the most rigged. Because uh, it's clear for everyone uh, in Pakistan, if you see the commentary that is coming from within Pakistan, that the election results are clear, that the army uh, in various ways is doing pre-election engineering, it will probably do some election engineering and post-election engineering to get a government that it wants in place and it is said that it will possibly be a selection of Nawaz Sharif so, uh, and his PMLN party. Despite external appearances, Pakistan's vote remained entrenched in a cycle of electoral manipulation with a history of military interference. No Pakistan Prime Minister has ever served his or her full five-year term in office, largely due to meddling by the military. Pakistan's powerful military establishment has ruled the country directly for more than three decades of its independent history. Even when not directly in power, the military has been accused of heavily meddling in political affairs. In November 2022, Pakistan's the then-retiring army chief, General Kamar Javed Bajwa, acknowledged in his fable speech that the military had meddled in political affairs for the past 70 years, which was unconstitutional, saying that they had now decided that they would not interfere in any political affair in the future. Few see any evidence of this happening and most observers believe it will take a very long time, if ever, for Pakistan's military to meaningfully retreat to the confines of its constitutional role. In a disturbing turn of events, Pakistani authorities are accused of coercing families of Baloch individuals killed in fake encounters to sign forms in order to receive their bodies. The illegal forms state that the killed persons were Baloch Liberation Army militants. However, many families are standing up against these false accusations, refusing to sign the deceptive forms. A report. The plight of the Baloch people continues unabated as Pakistani forces and agencies seem unrelenting in their campaign against them. The latest strategy involves a systematic persecution of innocent residents in the most underdeveloped province of the country. Reports suggest that to mask their egregious extrajudicial killings, the authorities are coercing families of deceased Baloch individuals falsely labelled as militants of the Baloch Liberation Army to sign forms before receiving the bodies. Refusing to succumb to false allegations, several families are courageously rejecting these deceptive forms. Prominent Baloch activists, including Dr. Maharang Baloch, are raising their voices against such inhuman treatment. For decades, thousands of Baloch have fallen victim to extrajudicial killings, their bodies callously discarded in remote areas across Balochistan. In response, certain protests are burgeoning throughout the region, 
decrying the atrocities committed. Organizations like the Baloch Yagjati Committee tirelessly advocate against extrajudicial killings and enforced disappearances. Recently, staging a poignant press conference outside civil hospital Quetta, Dr. Maharang Baloch passionately addressed the media, condemning the authorities' dismissal of the peaceful Long March demands, while emphasizing their perpetuation of oppressive policies. بلوچستان کے ہر شہر اور گاؤں سے ہزاروں لوگوں نے ریاستی ظلم اور جبر کے خلاف سڑکوں کا رخ کرتے ہوئے ریاست کے ان ظالمانہ پالیسیوں کے خلاف سخت ناراضگی کا اظہار کیا لیکن بلوچ عوامی رد عمل کے باوجود ریاست بلوچستان میں اپنی پالیسیوں میں کسی بھی طرح کی تبدیلی لانے کے لیے تیار نہیں ہے لانگ مارچ میں سینکڑوں لاپتا افراد کے لوائکین نے اس امید اور بھروسے سے مارچ میں حصہ لیا تاکہ ان کے پیاروں کو فیک انکاؤنٹر میں قتل نہ کیا جائے لیکن بدقسمتی سے ریاست بلوچستان کے حوالے سے اپنے ظالمانہ اور جابرانہ پالیسیوں کو جاری رکھنے کی خواہش رکھتی ہے حالیہ مچ واقعے کے بعد جس طرح زندان سے لاپتہ افراد کو نکال کر قتل کیا گیا یہ ظلم اور جبر کی انتیا ہے بلوچ ایکٹیوسٹس آر گیلونائزنگ گلوبل سپورٹ پٹیشننگ انٹرنیشنل اتھارٹیز ٹو ونٹروین ان دی آن گوئنگ جینوسائڈ They implored the United Nations and human rights organizations to hold the perpetrators accountable for their crimes, advocating for a fact-finding mission led by the UN Working Group to investigate the atrocities. In Balochistan, Pakistan's most neglected region, the Inter-Services Intelligence is accused of perpetrating a litany of atrocities including abductions, killings and torture, fostering a climate of fear and injustice. The pervasive sense of alienation and injustice have driven some Baloch individuals to take up arms, targeting Pakistani army personnel and Chinese assets in their bid for justice and autonomy. Let's now shift our focus to Afghanistan, where after the Taliban takeover, terrorist groups enjoy greater freedom in Afghanistan than at any time in recent history. And there are no signs that the Taliban leadership has taken steps to limit the activities of foreign terrorists in the war-torn country. This has been claimed by a recent UN report, which states that Al-Qaeda has established a network of training camps madrasas and safe houses in various provinces of Afghanistan. In the wake of the US troop withdrawal in August 2021, Afghanistan has descended into chaos, becoming a breeding ground for terrorism under the Taliban's rule. The resurgence of the Taliban has emboldened terrorist groups, granting them free reign across the country and posing a grave threat not only to Afghanistan, but to regional stability as well. Recent reports from the United Nations Analytical Support and Sanctions Monitoring Team have unveiled alarming developments. Al-Qaeda exploiting the Taliban's control has established a network of training camps, madrasas and safe houses in various provinces including Ghazni, Lagman, Parwan and Uruzgan. Al-Qaeda is now operating in 10 of Afghanistan's 34 provinces. The report further stated that the relationship between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda remains steadfast, with the latter operating openly under Taliban patronage. If you look at the, um, the ideology of Al-Qaeda and their trajectory of action, it has always been to ensure that in Muslim countries at least, secular leadership and secular government is overthrown by an Islamic uh, uprising. Uzbekistan faces a problem. The Uzbek authorities are acting on it. The other countries are not facing this problem at this point in time. But given the fact that the Al-Qaeda remains well-funded, it remains motivated, I think somewhere down the line, uh, whether we want it or not, the Central Asian Republics, India, Iran, as well as Russia will have to take uh, some uh, centralized action. We have to combine our strategies and coordinate our strategies and take action on it. 
However, the Taliban rejected the report calling it biased and far from reality. Al-Qaeda has used the Taliban's takeover to attract new recruits and funding and its affiliates worldwide. Despite Al-Qaeda's huge network in Afghanistan, which includes training camps, safe houses, a media operations center, and Al-Qaeda commanders serving in the Taliban government, the U.S. has only executed one hit since its withdrawal. That strike which killed Zawahari was conducted by the CIA. The Biden administration touted the ability to hit at Al-Qaeda and other terror groups if their presence is discovered using over-the-horizon counterterrorism capabilities of the U.S. military. However, the U.S. military has conducted zero counterterrorism strikes since the withdrawal. Where the United States is concerned, the precondition that it had set or apparently had set uh, to the Taliban that Al-Qaeda would not be uh, allowed to you know, set up camps out there are basically an eyewash. They wanted a face-saving way out. They wanted to tell the rest of the world that they were not running away from Afghanistan, that they had actually struck a deal with uh, the Taliban, which allowed them a uh, safe exit. I think the safe exit is the only thing that they had, uh, the Taliban had agreed upon. They did not fire upon the Americans. As for the other conditions, I don't think the Taliban ever had any intention of uh, keeping to those conditions if indeed those conditions were set. Furthermore, the Taliban's ties extend beyond Al-Qaeda. They have been harboring and supporting the tehreek taliban Pakistan, facilitating cross-border attacks and providing material support to further their shared goals. The UN report stated, the Taliban are generally sympathetic to TTP aims. Besides supplying weapons and equipment, Taliban rank and file, Al-Qaeda Corps and AQIS fighters assisted TTP forces in cross-border attacks. Some Taliban members also joined TTP, perceiving a religious obligation to provide support. Al-Qaeda Corps and AQIS continue to provide training, ideological guidance and support to TTP. Amidst these contradictions, the Taliban paradoxically seeks assistance from international actors in combating their primary rival, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant Khorasan province. The situation calls for urgent international attention and decisive action. The humanitarian crisis unfolding in Afghanistan demands a concerted effort to establish a permanent ceasefire and stem the tide of violence that threatens not only the Afghan people, but regional peace and security as well. This time has come for the global community to confront the complexities of the Afghan conflict and work towards sustainable solutions that prioritize the safety and well-being of all those affected. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.